Sarubanadi de Milan, good evening and welcome to episode 246 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzamandungwa Kumalo. It's a Friday edition of the Private Property Podcast. And before you get your weekend started, you know how we do it. Every single weekday at 7 p.m., you and I always have an appointment where we tackle a hot property matter that helps us navigate our property decisions. And it doesn't matter whether you're a landlord, whether you're a tenant, you're looking to buy, to sell or build. This is your only daily property talk show in South Africa that helps you navigate your property needs. To all our new viewers, welcome to it. You've certainly missed out on quite a number of great episodes. So do make sure you go to our Facebook and our YouTube page to catch up on all the great episodes that you've that you have already missed out on and something else that you probably missed out on are the other great shows that we've got across the private property social media pages i am talking about the home shoppers show that you can catch later on this evening at 8 p.m with chad it also comes to your screens on mondays at 8 p.m so if you're in the market for a new property well that is the show that you want to make sure you tune into the Tuesdays and Thursdays, award-winning farmer Umbali Noko brings you the Farming Podcast, where she takes care of all your agricultural needs and concerns. So if you've ever wondered how certain things in the agri-space are done, or perhaps you want to explore agriculture for yourself, then that is the show that you want to make sure you tune into. And every Wednesday, Essie Klassen takes you through the First Time Home Buyers Show, where she is always in conversation with somebody who has walked the that first time home buying journey and has gone on to grow their property portfolio uh, in quite significant ways. Those are some of the shows that you can catch right here on Private Properties social media pages. And of course, do make sure that you've subscribed to all our pages from Facebook to YouTube to Twitter to Instagram. Make sure you like, you follow, as well as subscribe to our channel. You can follow myself on social media. I'm at Zamantungwa underscore K on your Twitter as well as on Instagram. Well, this evening we are talking about something that affects every single one of us, particularly if you are living in a community scheme. I know we love talking about community schemes and it really is because so many of us are increasingly realizing the magnitude of living in a community scheme, the responsibilities that we have, uh, the rights that we have, and the rights we absolutely do not have. Because I think sometimes, you know, we think we have, I'll say, the same rights as people who have freestanding houses, but unfortunately, things are slightly different when you live in a community scheme. And this evening, we're looking at geezers and important considerations in community schemes. As the temperature changes, we tend to find that this time of year happens to also be the time of year where there's quite a spike in, um, in, in, in geezer incidents. And so you'll find that your community scheme is very likely lodging more insurance claims that are related to Giza round about this time of year than any other time of year. So we want to make sure that you, you know, understand what your rights are when it comes to Giza's, particularly when you live in a community scheme. And also just under better understanding the lifespan of a Giza and very sustainable ways that you can potentially explore, especially as a community scheme. I mean, one of the big things that uh, I love advocating for and even the guests that we always invite is getting involved in run in the running of your particular you know complex or community scheme and these are some of the things that you can advocate for and ask for um, in the scheme and of course what you can do to improve your situation as a as a, a body corporate in the event where you realize that look we're spending far too much money on giza claims and something simply needs to be done a more sustainable way uh, needs to be found we'll be exploring some of those issues this this evening i want to hear from you what your horror giza story is i was actually saying to my guest this evening that one of the things that is a bit unfortunate about Giza's bursting is, you know, it can burst and let's say you're at work or you're even out on a holiday and you come back to find that your place is flooded. I mean, I remember a friend of mine, he's got an investment property in the Bramfontein area. And at the time he was living, um, no, he was at the time he was living in, in, in Bramfontein and he had an investment property in Midrand. And 
the geezer burst where his tenant is staying. He was literally sending me, you know, the video of the, that the tenant had sent him saying this is something that he had to deal with. It was 11 o'clock at night and it was like, these are the joys of being a landlord. And I was like to him, listen, I know it's admin intensive. Luckily, you don't have to really pay for, you know, the geezer replacement. Insurance has got that covered because you're in a body court, you're in a complex. Uh, you will have to pay for access. But I want to hear from you, your horror geezer story. What happened? What was the damage? Uh, and how long did it take for, you know, for you to be able to resolve that particular damage? Do you share with us down here below? I'm keen to hear what some of the horror stories you've encountered when it comes to your geezer. But to help us better understand what we need to consider uh, when it comes to all things geezers in community schemes, this evening I'm joined by somebody who needs no introduction, Mike Addison, who is the owner at AdShaw. Mike, good evening and thank you so much for joining us. Good evening, Zama, and good evening to the listeners. Nice to be here again. Really good. It's always so great to have you, Mike. I mean, this evening we're talking about something that this time of year I know you have to deal with um, quite significantly, and that is, of course, the issue of visas. And I think this is one of those things that can be a pressure point because when it does kind of burst and there's damage, you know, a lot of us end up having a headache about it. But it's also one of those things that we never really preemptively think to try and whether solve or minimize so that we don't have to deal with those instances um, when, you know, something can happen. So we're never really preventative when it comes to Giza issues. We're always very reactive. I think firstly, just sort of take us through what we need to know and understand as people who live in community schemes when it comes to what our rights are where Giza's are concerned. Okay, so that's a good starting point. The Giza's in sectional title schemes. Um, it's a slightly different animal to a homeowner or your your usual, call it your usual insurance for your home, in that the prescribed management rules actually have something to say about Giza's. And it may come as a surprise to most people, but in fact, Giza's are not supposed to be covered by sectional title policies or by the scheme as such. Rule 31 is quite clear where it actually says, and that's your default rule. So you may have had amended rules, but the default management rule is that the owner is supposed to maintain and if necessary, replace the geezer when it's old and finished. So if the geezer, even if the geezer is in the ceiling at the top of the building and you're at the bottom of the building, ultimately that geezer is the owner's responsibility. So that might come as a surprise to many people because as soon as a geezer goes, you do hear a lot of demands being made by the owner. Because after all, the minute your geezer pops or there's water running out and you don't have hot water, all you want to do is get another geezer sorted out in there as quickly as possible so that you can have a hot shower tonight. So uh, not enough attention is really given to it. So let me just take that back. So the owner's actually responsible before we talk about a right. With that responsibility does come a right. So your right is that you are actually responsible to attend to that replacement. So very often, if an owner phones the managing agent, the managing agent will say to you, as we had this morning, um, pop out and find a plumber and have it replaced. And once you've got the invoice, send it in to us and we'll see if the insurance will deal with it. So that's, that's one way. But what, what has actually happened over the years, um, the banks entered the markets many years ago and they brought in policies that included Giza cover. So it followed that there was an expectation for people who moved into sectional title that Giza's would be covered when they you know, were put, kaput or finished and had rusted through. And um, years and years ago, Giza's used to last much longer and they used to be much cheaper, so it wasn't too much of a problem. However, these days and uh, inflation and the price of steel and components and everything has gone up over the years. It creeps up quite steadily and geezers have become more expensive. The insurance companies, you know, following the, uh, call it the customer expectation, have put together a geezer product, which is actually a geezer maintenance section in a policy. 
So most sectional title policies, the, the leading ones, have actually slipped in a geyser maintenance, and that allows the owners to have their geysers replaced on the insurance policy up to certain limits. That's how they've just control it. You have an excess of, say, 1,500 rand or 2,000, and you can have your geyser replaced up to, say, an 8,000 rand limit. And that's generally what's in place at the moment by default, but it comes with its problems. You as the owner, however, should have a right to decide what sort of product goes in there for the 8,000 Rand. And very often, you know, people tend to take the, as, as we discussed earlier, um, well, somebody will sort it out for me sort of attitude. Get involved, you know, um, try and find out what's going in, you know, you might be getting the old cheapy going in there, um, and in three years' time, you're just going to have the same problem again. So I think you'll you're understand that um, you are actually responsible, but with that responsibility comes the right to have a say in what goes in there. And perhaps, you know, try and get the whole policy. When I say policy, I'm not talking about insurance policy here, but policy of the body corporate, you know, get get a, a program in place where you can actually take better charge of those geezers. I am this evening in conversation with Mike Addison, who is the owner at AdShore. And we're talking about geezers and the important uh, considerations in the event where you are living in a community scheme. I see in our comments down here below on Facebook, a number of years have asked about uh, the previous episode that we wanted to, you know, the previous topic rather that we had planned for this evening. That is of course that conversation that I did promise you uh, with Shilly Boy, as well as Bruno, De De Sa uh, Bruno Samar rather. And that was around, you know, tax implications when it comes to our property portfolio. Don't worry, I'm still going to keep uh, my promise to you. I know that if you're subscribed to our mailing list, you would have also received the email that said that is what we're talking about this evening. We have not forgotten about it. Unfortunately, things sometimes happen behind the scenes and we have to shake things up and change things just slightly and make sure that we're still able to keep our daily appointment at 7 p.m. You know, unfortunately, as we always say in showbiz, the show must continue. So when many things are happening behind the scenes, we always make sure that we're still able to be here at 7 p.m. So we will definitely be coming back to that topic because understanding tax implications uh, to our property portfolios is such an important thing. I mean, I, I'm, I'm always the first one to talk about how I do not understand taxes. I have an accountant who handles all my taxes from business tax to personal tax and it makes sure that uh, I, I pay SARS for everything I need to pay SARS. And that SARS pays me back because it's also the joys of having a property portfolio is the opportunity to be paid by SARS. So we definitely are going to be exploring that topic and on more than one occasion because it's such an important one. So Mike, you know, coming back to our conversation and to, to our viewers at home, as I said earlier in the show, I want to hear from you your worst geezer story because I think this is one of those i have my own uh you know giza story to share i'll share it a bit later on in the show but mike you, you've already touched on this and i want us to explore it a little bit and this is around you know the lifespan of a giza because as i was saying one of the things that i've certainly noted um even where i currently live is there's almost always a contracting uh, a contractor's ban outside and almost every other week there's somebody's geezer that's being changed. Usually during the winter months, I see it more often, sometimes twice, sometimes even three times a week. And, and unfortunately, when you own a property, whether you're in a community scheme or perhaps even living you know, in a freestanding, you tend to find that you are having a geezer issue every three to five years or so. And, and that may sound like a very long time, but it's actually not. I mean, if we were to look at, let's say, a car, so that's almost having to deal with a relatively major car issue, um, you know, almost twice before you pay it off, really, if you kind of stick to uh, the contracting uh, period of most car car um, financing uh, terms. So I mean, how can we as consumers sort of find more sustainable ways of maybe picking the geezers that we choose or making sure that they just last longer? Because it's, it's as much as we don't think about it as much because we don't quite feel the financial implications of changing a geezer. And this, of course, you know, the damage was so big that you're able to like quantify it quite significantly in rands and cents. And even though insurance does also pay for that, 
um, you know, sometimes the time cost, obviously, one can't pay that back. But what are some more sustainable and perhaps long-term ways um, can we try to kind of mitigate, uh, you know, geyser damage as much as possible? Okay, so that's probably at the heart of matters. The so first of all, if you look at the geysers, you're quite right. I mean, this time of the year, particularly as you mentioned when you opened up, the geysers are going, they do tend to go much more as temperatures drop and there's during the time of the year like now where the daytime temperatures are higher and the low, t the evening temperatures are, are much lower. And so there's fluctuations and obviously that puts pressure on things that are about to go, especially for tanks that are under pressure. Now, most standard geysers are actually manufactured of mild steel, and I, I briefly explained this in a previous uh, podcast, because, um, but we only touched on it. Um, but most are made of mild steel geyser, um, mild steel, and then they're glazed with enamel. And the inside glazing can chip, and obviously usually does chip by the time it's, it's put into place. And they have what inside the geyser something called an anode. Now, the anode is supposed to keep the geyser going uh, for a longer life. It protects the geyser. I'm not going to go into an in-depth explanation there tonight. And the, the function of the geyser is to self-sacrifice. And after about two years, you're supposed to replace an anode. Now, in all practical terms, in, a, in, in your own home, you might be more inclined to go and change it. You know, your, it's in your garage or, or so on. But... In a body corporate environment, are you really going to go and find your geezer out there behind the wall on the common property and start scratching there and looking for, firstly, your geezer and then changing the anode? It's not something owners tend to do at all. In fact, I've only ever met one person, as I mentioned before, um, that's ever done that in my whole 26 years in this in this business. So, um, so it's not practical. And the, the geezers do tend to fail for various reasons, one of them being that people don't change the anodes, and secondly, that as time marches on, um, I'm quite sure it's common practice that we're all trying to find cheaper solutions, and so products are probably put in place, are built, you know, they're good products, but they're not, they're not necessarily there going to last, given um, that they're trying to keep geysers within reasonable cost frames. Okay, so that's the fact. Um, the 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 solution to that is to well, can I get a better product? Is there a longer lasting product? How much more expensive would a longer lasting product be? Now the other reality check is: this morning a geezer bursts at six o'clock in the morning. You're about to go to work. You, you know, really, you've got to get to work. And you've so you're going to be late now. You've got this problem, and you phone the nearest plumber, and you get your geyser replaced, and that's what you do because tonight you want hot water and you want to get to work. You don't want this hassle. So there's never planning for these things. People don't plan for the geyser to go, um, but believe it, believe it or not, much can be done if the body corporate trustees have actually thought about it, or the owners have put the the, the trustees to task on this. Uh, or have resolved that the trustee should investigate it, it can be looked at. You can actually look at products that might only cost 10 or 15% more than what a normal replacement product would be. That would be much longer lasting. Um, you've actually had the manufacturer and supplier of these geysers on your show before. Uh, a stainless steel, a trip, it's a triple four stainless steel geyser. Um, which does exactly the same job, doesn't cost much more, um, can be installed. And this thing will last, in fact, it's got a guarantee, a warranty for 10 years, but triple four stainless steel, as I've mentioned before again, um, will probably last 20, 30 years, maybe longer. My cutlery set is made of tri triple four steel and it's 60 years old. I know that it's 60 years old. So it's, you know, and not only that, it's clinical. I, 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 rather shower out of water that's coming out of a stainless steel container that's coming out of, you know, a sort of rusty old steel container. So, you know, there have many more benefits to, to look at this more seriously. And I think what owners should do is actually get trustees to say, come on, trustees, let's find out more about a better geezer solution. You see, 
not only is it this time of the year where, you, as you say, you're seeing a lot of plumbing trucks and uh, contractors around site fixing these things, it's also a matter of, well, what's it doing to our claims history? If your claims on your policy is regular and fast and furious, your, pre your claims start making the policy unsustainable. And the insurance company are going to do one of three things. They're either the worst case scenario is they're going to cancel your policy because they don't want to carry on losing money on an ongoing basis. The second thing they're going to do is to manage the policy by increasing the excess. That's why some buildings have got or some owners find themselves with a 3,000 rand excess or even higher uh, when it comes to a geezer claim. And, um, you know, they tighten up on the premiums. The premiums will will go up. If, if the claims ratio is um, double what it should be, um, they will double the premium um, or start increasing the premium exponentially. And, and things get out of hand. So it becomes what I call a racket. Everybody's making money except the poor owner is paying. Uh, the yeah. plumber gets his money. The insurance company get their money. The insurance broker gets their commission. And so the cycle continues every three to five years. So I think the, 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 the answer is really get it done properly. Uh, get it, get, when I say done properly, get, get it researched. Do some homework. Um, we, we've, we're having, over the last two and a half years, um, really working hard, really drilling down into it. I can tell you some stories where, um, where we've made a huge difference uh, to some schemes. Huge difference. And Michael, see if we'll be able to, you know, get at least one of those stories in terms of the difference that you've been able to make uh, with some schemes. We are taking your questions and comments this evening. <clears throat> all things geezers while living in a community scheme i had asked earlier on what your worst geezer story is and we've got a comment coming from who itumeleng uh Odian mash one of our top fan members saying stayed at a flat where the geezer was leaking and when i notified the owner he dragged his feet until the bathroom light went out and no longer working now it was a two in one issue i nearly fixed it but then remembered the horror stories of claiming back monies from owners. And we have a question coming through from Umatha Shingange asking, we've been using a gas geyser for now for a while now. Are they more durable than electric ones or a geyser is a geyser is a geyser? Mike? Yeah, um, I don't know much about gas geysers, to be honest. Um, we, we're actually investigating it. I, I, I was actually chatting to a managing agent this week about it, where, you know, some... Um, well, this particular complex has actually got a gas farm on their um, on their property, and then the gas feeds, and everybody's got a gas geyser. And I was wondering how that works. What I do know is some of the components are a bit expensive, but it sounds like a good system to me. Quite honestly, it sounds good, um, but yeah, it, it's not something that I know too much about. Mm. Insurable, no problem. Um, uh, but understanding it when tonight I'm really focused more on the tanks type of geezer um, rather than, than the technical issues. Mm. So, and I think Mike, then that brings us quite nicely to, you know, what you can do to improve the body corporates uh, situation when it comes to geezers. Yeah. The, the, there's, there's two main areas that, that would affect your, your geezer improvement or improve your claims ratio and longevity etc the, the the first thing is finding a product that would be you know longer lasting or a way of making your geezers last you know in all fairness some of the the cheaper geezers that you can put in you know if you're changing the anodes regularly that's one method the second thing is there's actually technologies where you can have uh, technology attached to your geezer which notifies via SMS and all sorts of fancy tricks, smart systems, which would um, alert you to when your geezer needs to be replaced or repaired or the anode replaced. So there are those things out there in the marketplace. Um, in fact, Suntum is quite, insurance is quite proactive on that score. I rather like um, the getting the right product, which doesn't have an anode even. Being stainless steel, it wouldn't even have an anode. Um, and not costing much more. So imagine something costs 10% or 15% more than the norm, yet it lasts 
you know, five More times as long. Five times long. Yeah. yeah, that that just makes common sense to me. The second thing is the honesty of your plumbing service. That's huge. That's you can't believe that. Uh, everybody thinks and trusts the people that are coming around, but you've got to really find out who to use because plumbers. Very often, I'm not saying all plumbers, don't get me wrong, you know, let's say a few bad eggs, um, will flip a geezer when it doesn't really need to be changed. Very often, a geezer just needs to be flushed um, and so forth. And, um, and you know, getting that right, you can actually bring, I mean, we've seen a building that was on, on average, they were changing 14 or 15 geezers a month. And just by changing the service provider, it dropped down to four or five geezers a month. That tells you a story. Um, so those are the two main factors: getting getting the right product uh, in place, you know. And, and the higher product doesn't necessarily mean an increase in premium. We've actually done a few policies with with no increase in premium. Uh, what horrifies me: I saw a policy today which has a ten thousand rand limit on the policy as it stands. Now they bring it to to us to look at, and I'm saying, well, what geezer are you putting in for ten thousand rand? Well, from ordinary geezers. Well, the plumber must be making a nice profit because you can have a stainless steel geezer for 9,800 Rand. Um, so, you know, it's just a matter of looking at it a bit deeper and getting proper advice. Uh, I think that's key. Get get an expert in. Um, the, 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 I've got a prime example from, from yesterday. It follows from yesterday. Michael Schaefer, some of you, I know your regular followers, you watched last night's episode. Uh, Michael Schaefer from Zedfin alluded to a scheme uh, in uh, Kempton Park, um, oh, Glen, Glen Marais Park to be quite exact because I was at that very meeting, um, where part of the solution for the maintenance plan and sorting out, you see, if you get all a team of professionals together, the Michael Schaefer's, uh, et cetera, et cetera, to, to work with your trustees, you, you, you sort everything out in one shot. First of all, that scheme, um, no premium difference, no increase in pre – no, sorry, I must be honest. There was a slight premium increase there. means that the geezer problem gets solved. The claims ratio is out of out of canter by a long shot, and it's going to have a detrimental effect on that policy. the The whole scheme was degrading, as Michael explained, and the insurance will fall away if they don't fix it. It will it will be horrific. And the 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 second the most interesting thing was by bringing in your geezer expert. So we know who the geezer expert is. As I said, he's been on the show. He comes in as well, and he says, "No, well we." why don't we put the geezers on the roof? And not only that, we'll do solar geezers on the roof. Turn to Michael. So Michael produces a solution with finance. It's going to cost each owner 500 rand a month for five years to pay for a brand new solar geezer on their roof. If you want to pay cash, that'll cost you 21,000 rand. But the electricity savings, the average owner has an 800 to 900 rand electricity bill. And it is almost confirmed that 60% of that bill is heating the hot water. So the 450 Rand electricity savings, okay, electricity savings alone, plus we can remove the premium for geezers because we don't need to insure them anymore because they're now brand new, 10-year guarantee and on the roof for 50 Rand a month, plus the excess of 30 Rand a month falls away. So they're actually in credit. If they put solar panels on the roof, stainless steel, no insurance, everybody's got a brand new geezer, and they and the savings in electricity at today's rates, never mind next year's rates, mm. pays for the geezer. Mm. So yeah, it's quite amazing what you can actually do if you just look further than your nose, instead of mm. just rolling these geezers, all these geezers over and over and over. Mm. And it's definitely, you know, what Michael was making reference to yesterday, Mike, you know, around the issue of looking holistically at maintenance issues in a community mm. scheme and for trustees to be able to take a very long term view in addressing some of the issues and not mm. just looking at counting costs almost one by one 
um, right now because it's become so important that uh, certainly as trustees and even members of the body corporate that we take a holistic long-term view in addressing mm -hmm. issues in our community schemes because the savings as you've so nicely pointed out um, can stack on in you know in the months and obviously in the years uh, to come but before we wrap up mike any final tips for our viewers at home when it comes to all things relating to geezers when of course they live in the community schemes yeah i think uh, i know it's not the most exciting thing we've got more interesting things to look at on a friday night i'm quite sure than a geezer um but really i think think about Next time you go to your AGM as an owner, because I notice, um, I try to have a look and see if I notice any managing agents on on the, on your guests when I'm when I'm attending and watching the show. Um, I see it's mainly owners that seem to be here. So as owners, I think get involved. Um, don't just sit out there and complain about the trustees. Rather, you know, encourage it. Even if you don't want to be a trustee, be proactively positive. You know, say to the the guys, listen, I was on a show the other night. I heard about these geezers. I heard about these maintenance plans uh, and the evening before. Um, can we look at this? You know, can we investigate, um, find out about these stainless steel geezers? I'm not mentioning products here tonight at all. I'm just saying look at, contact your managing agent, find out, you know, where's the stainless steel? Where can I get it? You know, can we get hold of Mike Addison? Maybe he can point us in that direction. You know, I'm not a plumber by any means. I'm an insurance broker, but I, I work with these experts and I can mm. see the positive results. So I think from that point of view, as an owner, if you're a trustee on the show tonight, definitely, definitely go and find out. That's your responsibility. And you've actually got a duty as a trustee, really, uh, you know, to to do the best for your scheme. And, and it's a no-brainer to go and find out more about these these things. And Mike, that's a great place for us to leave it. I do want to echo what Mike is saying. Make sure you get you know, involved, be proactive. And if you are a trustee, explore alternative ways that your community scheme can go about you know, doing business and more sustainable products that you, you can use for your community scheme. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. It's always such a pleasure to have you on the show. Pleasure. Nice being here. Cheers. Good night. Have a good weekend, everybody. Thank you so much. And that is Mike Addison, who's the owner at, at Shaw, and hoping he also has a very good weekend. Well, that's it from myself, Zamantu Wakumalo, this evening on the Private Property Podcast. I am, of course, handing over to Chad at 8 p.m. We'll be taking you through the first, not the first time, the Home Shoppers Show uh, before you get your weekend started. I do hope that you'll be enjoying the show until Monday evening at 7 p.m. Hoping you'll be staying home and staying safe. I'm Alan Footman, I'm a sports tour operator from Cape Town. My family and I have been living in the southern suburbs for 21 years. What we love about the neighbourhood is it's very family orientated. Lots of things for the kids to do, uh, especially here where we are next to the farm where folk can walk the dog, go for runs and enjoy the fresh air. In the southern suburbs, we're lucky enough to have some of the top schools in the country. And on top of that, we have the University of Cape Town, one of the most famous universities in the world. 
Newlands is a great suburb. All the sporting amenities, Newlands rugby ground, cricket ground, etc. Down the road at Claremont, lots of shopping centres for the kids and for the mothers to do their shopping. Fantastic pubs and restaurants around like Forries, Springbok Bar. Bishop's Court is full of beautiful upmarket homes. Kirstenbosch Gardens, National Botanical Gardens right next door. What attracted us to Constantia is, is the large open spaces. I've always wanted to be a farmer and now I'm living next to Kruger Constantia Wine Estate, the oldest wine farm in, in the country where you have fantastic wines, great restaurants, got the best of both worlds. My family and I have loved every moment of living in Constantia. We couldn't be happier and this is our neighbourhood.